Welcome to Justina Wines Podcast. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. I'm your host, Lori, and this is a podcast about all things wine. I was extremely happy to attend the Vino Verde experience in New York City last month. Vino Verde literally means green wine. However, that is not a reference to the color. There are two connotations to the name. First, and the more accepted one, is that it is a wine to be consumed young, i.e. green. The second meaning is in relation to the fact that there is a lot of rain in the area, so the landscape is green. Whichever interpretation you would like to accept, Vino Verde is a Portuguese wine that originated in the historic Minho province in the far north of the country. The modern-day Vinho Verde region was originally designated in 1908, includes the old Minho province plus adjacent areas to the south. However, in 1976, the old province was dissolved. During my time at the event, I interviewed two Psalms who were working the event, several winemakers, and the president of the Vino Verde Alliance. A few takeaways from the event include that Vino Verde is not a grape variety, it is a DOC for the production of the wine. The name literally means green wine, but translates to young wine. And the wine may be red, white, or rosé, although the majority is white. A Vino Verde can also be a sparkling, a late harvest, or even brandy, and may have slight effervescence. Slancha.
rot as well because it exposes them to more wind, which can prevent the rot. So that's one thing. And when you do bring them up a little bit too, you get a little bit more direct sunlight. But they are moving a little bit away, away from that. They're getting a little bit more modern with cord on training instead of pergolas, which I think one, that's definitely one of the ones that they would know more as to why they are doing it. But I know it's, it's a potential like shift in the traditional pruning. I wonder if it has anything to do with obviously in a pergola, everything is going to have to be manually harvested. And if you go to using the typical cord on training, you could go to mechanical harvesting and Commercial reasons would definitely play a factor for sure. And I think they might even be relying more on the, the heat close to the ground as well. So that could be another. Um, how big is this region and where exactly is it located? Well, Univerde is the biggest um, region within Portugal. So it actually spans from the very northern tip of Portugal, which is kind of adjacent to the Rio-Crisis region of Spain, and then it goes all the way down to Europe. So it, it, it has a really long, extensive uh, presence in Portugal. And the main, uh, there's rivers attached to the river, the Mino River in the north has a, a big role, and then it goes all the way down to the Duro River in the south. So you're kind of dealing with um, something like 100 kilometers or something like that? 7,000, 7,000. Yeah. big. And it's more um, narrow than wide, correct? Right? Right. Yeah, so they're, they're probably trying to keep the effect of the ocean, right? So if they expand out to the east, it wouldn't be as distinctive. So they've made it that narrow, small region to maintain the consistency of the wines and have that Vino Verde style. Yeah. So I know that in the region, they're one of the actually oldest wine making regions. It's back almost 2,000, if not more than 2,000 years. But when did it become an official POC? So it became an official POC in 1990, I would say. So they really didn't start, you know, creating actual like de demarcations until around that time. But it was the first one in Portugal to be demarcated. Um, just because of its like distinctive wine suitability. It, it does have so much that affects the wines. They want it to go that way. So it actually, even though that whole area technically is young in terms of demarcation, right. um, it, it's, it's one of the older there. ones. It's one of the older ones. It's older than real stations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it is older than um, a lot of you know neighboring regions in terms of its wine making tradition. And that's one of the things that kind of amazes me is it is so you think of you think of port and you think of uh, you know uh, real estate so the tradition is so so far back there yet they're so new when it comes to actually being recognized as a tourist. Right. And I think that's the main problem that's plaguing Portugal in general is that when anyone thinks Portugal they automatically go to port, right? And a big thing is too we're not familiar with the grapes, you know, so Alvarinho is one of the main grapes, um, Tejadora is a main grape, Arento, Aldeso, so no one knows these grapes, so that's what makes it difficult for the wine to gain recognition. And sadly, I think Americans like to drink wines that they can pronounce. Like, they have to look up how to pronounce it, it's an issue, you know, I mean, you have a lot of the German grapes, but people drink Riesling because they can pronounce it. Um, so you actually just mentioned um, one of the main um, grapes and varieties, but Pinot Verde actually does have red grapes also, correct? Yes, so the main red grapes, the pronunciations once again are a little bit difficult, but there is red wine up there as well. So Espadero and Dinhao uh, and Padero are the, uh, the three main red grapes, and a lot of that is going into the grape production as well. So they're using those red grapes for rosé, and then lighter, um, more delicate reds as well. If you had to give an estimate, not a specific number, uh, out of the 100% of wine that's being made in Pinot you know, Verde, what percentage would be white? 90%. So it's, it's really a big portion of white, but they are doing a little bit of the rosé. And is that more newer 
So probably that's horrible grammar right there. But um, is okay. the red coming out is new or have I think, I mean, we could definitely consult with some of the winemakers here, but in my opinion, I find that they are getting a little bit more, uh, there's probably a tendency to make more red wine because the technology is catching up, right? So I think they're, they're doing more temperature control. They have more, you know, cleanliness in the winery. So that's helping to kind of expand the repertoire of wines and the red wines are gaining more popularity. Okay. And if somebody wanted to walk into a store and they were to say, all right, I'm going to go explore experience as a winner, what would be two characteristics that you would say they can expect right. from that Yeah, so Vito Verde, the big, the big one is that really nice, sharp, bright, refreshing acid. So do you want a high acid wine? Citrus-driven, citrus notes, and just really crisp. That's your your start. That's your vino verde. But as I'm kind of showing you, the the grapes Alberino does age well as well. So I would, in my opinion, I would start with that really young, fresh, vibrant vino verde, and then maybe after the wine store, do they have one that's a little more aged to experience how it can evolve as well? So that would be more textured, more smooth, and a little bit uh, more right food character, right, instead of the really young person. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm back with another song from New York City, Charles Springfield, and we're going to talk a little bit more about generalizations of the Vino Verde region, and then we're going to go in specifically into terroirs and how it affects the wines itself. So first, um, Vino Verde kind of is known for fizz, right? So, but how did that fizz get in there? Sure. So uh, Vino Verde has a couple of different uh, connotations. A lot of people are familiar with a Vino Verde style that's going to be low in alcohol and have a little bit of an effervescence, a little bit of trapped CO2. So whenever you ferment the grape, the yeast on the skins eat the sugar, converts that to alcohol, and that releases carbon dioxide. But in this in this version, it's a little bit trapped, and sometimes some winemakers will add a little bit of a carbon dioxide in there to give a little bit of fizz, because people are familiar with that kind of style. Um, but in this table, we have a little bit of a kind of a to take away a little bit of break from that kind of style. None of these have an effervescent in them, but they're going to be a little bit more complex versions of uh, Vino Verde. It really opens up people's minds in a lot of ways. And Vino Verde is known to be a light wine. Uh, what is the average, not specific, average um, alcohol content that somebody can expect in these wines? Yeah, sure. You can go as low as around 8%. And I have wines here as high as 13.5. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, that yeah. surprised me. I didn't think it went that high. Yeah, it could be very high. They're known to be kind of light to medium. So on the lighter side, you get like I say 8%. Um, this side, we have like slightly warmer climates. The grapes get really ripe. But it's like more sugar. That extra sugar produces a little more alcohol. So 13.5 or something. Excellent. And so Vito Verde has a lot of um, different varieties. Sure. So I think it's a great wine for food pairings, and there is a whole bunch of examples of food pairings here, but what would you suggest two or three best food pairings? Oh sure, like if you go from the lighter Vino Verde, um, definitely like light shellfish, um, anything seafood related, um, so really light cheese, and you can do like if you have a slightly sweeter, um, like I would say sweeter, but a little fruitier, something a little bit spicy, so maybe like um, maybe some sausage, chorizo, or something from Spain. You can have like Thai food or even Indian food. Uh, really interesting to pick up some of that residual sugar in the wine. Yeah. And, and your, your comment triggered a whole other question because I think a lot of people out there don't understand the concept that sweet does not necessarily mean sugar, residual sugar. Yeah, yeah. So I tell people, like, think about um, ripeness in, in terms of fruit, like a ripe apple. As a pair, or like um, even if you get a ripe lemon, that's going to be kind of tart. Um, but you think about sweet, think more like sugar and candy, that kind of so to separate the two a little bit. And Vito Verde is fermented uh, to dryness. Yes, yes, really the dryness, and they, it goes to different levels like we talked about. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be a dry wine. Some of the ones with lower sugar, I mean lower alcohol, have a little bit more residual sugar, so that comes off a little bit more fruity. Yeah. Um, so how close is Vito Verde to location? To okay, sure. So, um, exactly the same region, and then we are at the lower southern Vino Verde area, and we're right by the Dora River. 
and that's where, of course, it's made. Yeah. So it kind of seems general. A lot of people don't realize uh, Vino Verde is actually a demarcated area in Portugal. Uh, they think about it as a, a green wine or a young wine, but it's a de demarcated area, but also has a connotation of being young and fresh. But you also saw from the other table, it can be aged as well. So uh, a lot of different thoughts of that. And then also, the other thing that people don't realize when they go to Vino Verde, it's pretty much green um, a lot of the time of the year, so that's another connotation, the, the green, the Verde part. Yeah. And that's actually where the name came from, yeah. the green of the area, not it's not green wine. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people think it's either going to be green wine or the grapes are really um, green. But they, that's in the early um, ripening. When they, when they ripen well, then they turn into like they, the pale yellow and things like that. But yeah. <laughs> and lastly, uh, there are nine subregions within the Vino Verde region. Yes. So, um, what is some? I mean, not all nine, you know, but like, what are the general? changes as you go through. Oh, sure. So if you go to the uh, the northern inland part, um, you can still get a little bit of that maritime breeze from the Atlantic Ocean, but you have a really cold climate. So those, gra those grapes from that region get really underripe or barely ripe. They retain a high level of acid, so you're going to have a kind of tart, tangy fruit, with a little bit of saltiness to it. Um, you go to the coastal, coastal of the Atlantic, and also by the Minnow and Doro rivers between those, a lot more of that kind of uh, sea influence. And then you get... Close to the Douro in the southern part of Vino Verde, uh, a lot warmer climate. So really um, ripe grapes. It gives a um, texture of like maybe like something like close to a Chardonnay in texture. So very different styles that people think about Vino Verde. Slightly richer style that's going to hold up better with like uh, richer cheese, maybe like uh, chicken and maybe sometimes pork. Yeah. And that's going to lead us right into your discussion of these three. Yeah. Wines you have here? Yeah, so we have uh, yeah, the three wines. The first one is from the um, to a more coastal region off the Atlantic, Loreo. So that is actually, these are all 2017 wines, so that you know, goes into the young, fresh version. Um, so a lot more bright citrus notes, lemon lime, a little bit of saltiness to it, um, very clean and fresh. Then we go over to the um, southern part um, by the Dora River, we have a Vaso, which is a little richer texture. Like, that's kind of more like, it has no oak on it, but it feels like the texture of like maybe an unoaked Chardonnay. Uh, but it still has uh, like stone fruit, like peach and apricot, and a little bit of apple notes and pear. So it looks slightly richer. And we go to the last one, we have the uh, Avarino, which is uh, the uh, northern part, uh, the uh, northern coastal. And so very, very sharp and very bright. Um, but more complex, we get the citrus notes and uh, green apple. We also get a little bit of a nutty element, like an almond. Yeah, almond skin. So really complex. So three different, three different, different distinctive wines that, are, that show very unique terroir in that region that can really, I think, it just really surprises people how vast and varied these wines can be. Thank you very much. Thank you. the Vino Verde region. So first, what is president of a DOC region? What is that? <laughs> well, this looks like a very gray and square-minded thing, but no, really, all the European regions have an association of producers which helps certify and promote their wines. That was what happens with us. We have 15,000 uh, small grape producers and 600 bottlers, and so they all elect someone to help them uh, promote their business, and that's that's what I do, and it's, it's an exciting prospect, and, and I'm very happy with this. And what is your background? Is it more in the wine, or is it more into marketing? Like, what's your individual background? It's more into marketing. I was in Brussels doing something different. They invited me to go back to Portugal, help promote Vingo Verde, and so I've been doing that for over a decade now. Wow, that's exciting. Um, so, what would be one distinctive characteristic of the region you know? The our region is very close to the sea, and the whole region is a sort of an amphitheater towards the sea. So the, the coastal influence, the Atlantic influence on the wine is very, very remarkable, and gives the wine this personality. The granite on the soils as well, and of course the varieties. So what you'll find in the wines is perhaps a bit lower alcohol than you'd find in other whites. Certainly a bit more acidic, uh, fresher wines. So I think they are very good for the kind of uh, food that we're looking for today which is more simple, more back to the, the roots of the of what we look to eat. And so we think of, we think of, it, of it as a very well-balanced wine with the, the gastronomy we have today. And if somebody wanted to go to Vino Verde from here, New York City, whatever, how exactly, like, what, 
Is the airport closed? Is the traveling easy? Is tourism, how's tourism there? Well, they're very welcome. Uh, now we have direct flights from New York to Oporto, which is, Oporto is a, a big wine uh, city in Portugal because around Oporto we have the port wine uh, region, of course. You have Vino Verde just to the north, just a few miles to the north. And then on the south we have Dao and Barada, which are other uh, wine regions. And of course, you have the Spanish side, which is just an hour's drive. So from Porto, from Oporto, you can see a number of wine regions, one of which is Vino Verde. Vino Verde starts just north of Porto, it goes up to the, uh, to the uh, Spanish border. Uh, what can you do there? Well, it's a r big region with 48 counties, uh, with a lot of small villages and places to stay. It's very good to walk or to cycle around. Uh, and of course the roads now are, are very safe and very interesting to drive around. So it's a great vacation place. Also by the sea, of course. Uh, uh, part of our region borders with Spain and the rest borders, of course, with the sea. So we have almost, uh, let's say, 100 miles of beaches from Porto up to, the, up to the, the Spanish border. It's a lovely place to live. And unfortunately, the US, especially New York, is having much better, much better weather than we are now. But that's where it is. What would you recommend as the best time of year to go visit? I would say spring, perhaps a bit the summer, and then the harvest seasons in September and early October. Especially because it's a cooler region, so the summer is not very violent there. Uh, and spring, of course, is, everything is blossoming. It's a fantastic moment. And then the harvest season. We start harvesting middle of uh, August. Now earlier than in the past, the climate is warmer, so we start harvesting a bit earlier, and then we finish by October the 5th or October the 7th. So I would say the month of September would be great to visit the region, enjoy good weather, good food certainly, and why not take part in the harvest? Can, uh, can they accept volunteers during harvest season? Like a lot of the American wineries accept volunteers during harvest, is that something somebody could do? Certainly. You see. Uh, as we have 15,000 grape producers, the vast majority of, the, uh, majority of them are very small. So what they do is they gather with their families on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays, harvest, and then on Monday they go do something else. So uh, people who show up at wineries by the middle of the week, they will certainly find that they are very welcome. They'll be able not only to participate in the, in the harvest, which is interesting, but also feel this family environment of everybody getting together then at lunch and dinner and enjoying the harvest and producing the wines. And if somebody was going to go on vacation to the wine region, the other day, um, how do they go about in you know Napa, Sonoma, there's some wineries that require reservations. Where I'm from in Paso, there's not too many that require reservations. It's more family run, so you see the winemaker behind the table and people can just pop in when we're open. So what is it more like there? Well, we have three or four wineries which in fact require reservations. They are bigger, but most of them are not. So if, if you show up, they'll be surprised to receive someone from uh, so far away and they will certainly welcome you immediately and give you the opportunity to share some time with them. And they'll be happy to do that. Also, because there are so many of these producers, you can see the harvest anywhere. There are people carrying uh, bags with, uh, with uh, grapes all over the place. Uh, the main squares have a different arrangement so that all the l uh, lorries can pass with the grapes and everything. So it's a bit of a festive moment in which people get together and you can feel that the harvest is in the air, not just in the wineries, but also in the small villages uh, in every, everywhere where you within the region. Yeah. And in terms of um, the grapes themselves, I know that traditionally they're mostly um, pergolas, and that I'm assuming has something to do with the climate and allowing the moisture, the wind to hit them. But I learned today that they are starting to go towards actual cordons and cordon training. Do you, what's the reasoning behind that? Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, in the 40s and the 50s, uh, while the north of Europe was in war, we, we were not, but we had a big famine. It was very difficult to live at those times. So people would, uh, in the middle of their fields, they would plant anything that would grow food, and they would have the, the vines around the field, and they would look for altitude as an alternative to occupation of the soil. And so you had those vines which actually had a, a great exposure to the sun, and they got wind, so it was actually very interesting. Of course, today that's not the case. So what you find in the region is this very interesting balance, while you have the new vineyards, which are cordon and are what you find in the best 
of, let's say, vineyard management all over the world. And then side by side you have those which are very old and produce different kinds of wines. Uh, they are very difficult to prune and def very difficult to harvest, of course, you have, because you have to go upstairs and the stairs are very high. So it's a, it, it, I would say it's a very ethnic, uh, traditional method, which is not the majority of the, the production, but which is uh, very interesting because wine is culture. Wine is not just a drink and alcohol, not at all, it's culture. And so I think we should, of course we have new vineyards, but we should visit and preserve those old vineyards, which are very much a characteristic of our history. So we're very proud of them, and some of those wines can be found here. You mentioned that most of the wine makers are family wine. Um, how, how, what's the average size bottle production of, of the, the wine? Most of the producers, what they do is they produce grapes and then they either deliver their grapes on a local cooperative or sell their grapes to a larger firm. So most of the producers will produce two tons, perhaps less, which they will carry somewhere else. And then you have uh, firms which go from five, ten thousand liters to up to uh, a, a few million liters. The largest of them produces uh, 12 million liters, which is a very large firm, acquiring grapes from seven, eight hundred uh, grape producers. So I would say we have all the sizes. Of course, even the largest ones are not very large. And the smallest, on the smallest ones, you can say, you can have a family which harvest all the grapes in uh, one weekend or two weekends. They make two or three uh, thousand liters. Two brands, let's say a normal and a special blend, and that's it. And how about um, uh, Italy? Are they are they exporting wine to Italy? Yes, we produce roughly the whole region produces roughly 70 million liters a year. Uh, we've been making a big effort, not only in improving our vineyards, therefore our wines, but also in proposing our wines to clients uh, overseas that will give us the value that we think we should uh, have for the wines and that will like our wines. In the year 2000, we were exporting 15% of the business, and when we closed 2017, that value was up to 50% uh, of the business. Now, the two major clients are the US and Germany, two very different markets. In the US, we have all the our varietals, like uh, Alvarinho, Loreiro, Azal, and others. So the more interesting wines, the ones which have more value. In Germany, it's very curious because we sell a bit more to, the US, to Germany than to the US. However, the German market is very much based on large supermarkets, which buy lower quality, uh, and I would say, more competitive wines in terms of price. So in the US, actually, this is the market outside Portugal where we can find our best varieties. So we're very happy because of this event, of course, because we're bringing here the very best wines we have. And so we are at the Vino Verde Experience in New York City, and this is a traveling experience. Where have you been? Where are you going? Well, we have this uh, event in New York. Uh, it's a very interesting choice. New York, Rio, and Sao Paulo in Brazil. So, <laughs> wow. so last year we had a, one event here uh, in Brooklyn, actually, and this year we have uh, New York. And then in the winter we'll be going to Rio and Sao Paulo, which is a, 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 an alternative. And of course Brazil is an important market for us because of the cultural connections. We speak the same language, and of course many Portuguese reside in Brazil, and we share a lot of uh, values. Uh, the idea here is to suggest to anyone who wants to visit us to try uh, a selection of the best Vino Verdes which, with a selection of different foods so they can, they can try the pairings and see how it works. Uh, of course, here what we have are tables with a number of producers and each one will bring different blends and of course there are their own varietals, uh, whites and rosés, one or two may have reds but mainly whites and rosés which are our best wines. Oh, so we're lucky here in New York. I thought there were different uh, cities in New York, like I thought maybe you'd go to San Francisco. No, after this great weather uh, that we're enjoying in New York, we should wait for the winter and then go to Rio, which is also a good choice, I'd say. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to thank meet you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And he is a winemaker. And so first off, what 
is it like to have, how do you start the production in, um, in you know, like, like what's your season? Uh, in, the, in the region, we have the harvest during September, October, and uh, we, I am producing wines uh, in my company since more than 20 years. Wow, okay. So, um, our, so that then, your harvest season, or your growing season, is basically similar to our in California. So, are you, have you already had bud break? Yes, 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 I believe in California. Okay, excellent. So let's take us through Alvarino. Uh, Alvarino is uh, it's, uh, one of the most important grape varieties in the Vinifeta region. Uh, we also have Loreiro. Loreiro is the most predominant grape variety. But uh, both grape varieties are in very well, very good for in the region because they have a very good potential in terms of aromas, in terms of flavors. And uh, that is uh, what we are exploring when we are using these grape varieties in the wines. Uh, in the case of the single varieties of Alvarinhos, they, they are wines that they have not only the freshness that is traditional on the Vino Verde region, but also a very good potential to age. So it's a, it's a wine that would have a very good evolution, very, in terms of complexity, in terms of structure. So with uh, the Vino Verde, it's not only fresh if you're drinking wines, we could have much and much, much more than that. And uh, the Alvarino is uh, it's a great variety, very important when we are trying to, to do that kind of wines. In terms of the grape itself, what are your major concerns as the grower? You know, are you worried about uh, rot? Are you worried mold? Are you worried, you know, what's your concern? Uh, in, in Portugal, in the Minho region, where we produce the Vinho Verde wines, uh, we have um, a very difficult climate uh, because uh, we are near the Atlantic Ocean, so we have a lot of humidity, a lot of rain. So uh, our our main concern in terms of the production of the grapes, not only Alvarinho but also the other grapes, it's um, it's uh, the control of the disease because uh, in the, in our region uh, we must be uh, really carefully about that and uh, it's uh, this is why for example in our region it's uh, it's very difficult to do like uh, biological wines uh, only in a small uh, small quantities very small quantities because of the, the conditions the natural conditions we have so that is uh, our main concern and a lot of the wineries, you know, we're concerned with getting the harvest in when it's, you know, before a rainfall. You have a lot of rainfall, correct? So, how does that correlate into your planning of when you're going to harvest? Uh, usually, uh, in the last years, in the last years, uh, we have a great uh, climate during the harvest. Uh, sometimes it's true that we have uh, rain. Uh, I remember some years ago that is usually that in the end of the harvest we usually have uh, a lot of rain already. But um, in the last three years uh, it was for uh, years very good uh, with a very good climate, very sun, the, uh, hot hot weather during the harvest. And uh, the reason why you including during the year it was much much easier for us to control the disease so we need to have to have uh, to do much less uh, treatment in the in the during the, the the evolution of the grape in the vine arts uh, because of the the, the, the the well conditions that we could have in the last years. Uh, also because of that uh, it's, uh, we have seen in the last years that uh, the Vino Verde is growing a lot and uh, growing a little bit in terms of the alcohol level. So the alcohol level of the Vino Verde today is not uh, the same that like, we have uh, some years ago. Uh, and uh, the principal reason of that is because of the conditions, the, the climate conditions that we are having in the last years here in the Argos. Yes, that's something that I've noticed here today is that I had in my brain um, 9, 10% for Albumio, and I'm seeing that some of them are up in the 13%. So the climate, the increased day, increased temperatures during the day is increasing the alcohol. Yes. But and, the principal in the case of the Albarino, because in the Albarino, uh, to, be a, to use a, a, a 
video beer, the Alvarino DLC, you need to have a minimum of 11.5. And, and it's usual to have, for example, in our Alvarino, we have 13. So that is um, uh, between 12.5 and 13.5. It's uh, usually when, uh, when we are talking about the single variety Alvarino. But in the case of even in the case of the other grape varieties, we are getting higher alcohol level uh, because of the, the climate conditions. Not only because of that, because also because of the way that we uh, nowadays we are producing the grape uh, in this region to maximize the exposure of the sun to have uh, better conditions to produce. So I like the soil consistency. Very primitive soil. It's uh, the traditionally that we kind of need. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Nice meeting you. of uh, 6,000 bottles, uh, more or less, and we just do it uh, our rate of our team a year. We also make uh, 10,000 bottles of sparkling a year, uh, but uh, that's why we don't we want to buy grapes. Uh, we just want our wines to have the, the grapes of our team. Okay? So, is the, you have the sparkling of an Alvarino also? Yes, and the uh, 100% uh, sparkling Alvarino. Yes. So, let's get into a little bit of the technical aspects of it. How many hectares do you support? Yeah, we have 10 hectares, uh, all in the, close to the river Minho, uh, in the border of uh, Galicia and Spain. Uh, and, uh, we have uh, 20 this plantation has uh, 20 years, so it's very, very good uh, the grapes now and the wine. And what is the, so you're up north, that, that's the northern region of Vino Verde? Yes, the region of Vino Verde. Uh, particularly uh, the Alvarino region, that uh, Monsal Melgastro, uh, that is the birth of Alvarino. I'm hearing that there's mostly granite soil throughout, is that what you're Yes, yes, granite, granite. Uh, and uh, there, in Monsal Melgastro, we have particular climate uh, because of the mountains uh, uh, that protect us from the sea. That's why the Alvarinho becomes so fantastic uh, producers uh, there in Monsal Melgastro. In terms of the actual process of picking it, are you picking different rates for your still for the single bridal Alvarino versus the champagne, or is it just an all Yeah, we normally pick it to one month, one month, three weeks earlier to make the sparkle. And is it a different block of fruit? Or uh, we, we should. Normally, we choose uh, a higher, uh, a higher part of the quinta, of the part, uh, because uh, there the characteristics are more acidity and uh, better for the sparkling wine and, and less uh, alcohol. And how are you producing the sparkling? Is it in the champagne method? It... No, it's it's a traditional way, the champagne way. Uh, normally, we just bottle. Uh, uh, 18 two years after the vineyard, okay? And is that, I, you are the first person I've heard that is making sparkling in the region, so it's not very popular? Um, it's, uh, it begins now being characteristic. Uh, a lot of producers are now beginning to make sparkling. Uh, uh, maybe in this moment, maybe we have uh, 15 uh, producers facing that part of the yeah, okay? And now tell me, what caught my eye was your label, the bird. Tell us the story behind your bird. 
bird, uh, our farm uh, was established by the king in the 16th century. Uh, it was a feudalist, you know, the king uh, sent the family to collect uh, taxes. So uh, our farm was chosen by the king uh, to the people of the region take all the ten percent of all that all that produce. You know? uh, they produce some ten percent. They take that. Uh, maybe uh, the, the old king thought it was the better land of the last son in that moment. Okay. Uh, maybe that's why our wine is uh, so fantastic, too. And now, for being a small producer in terms of being yourself, you know, growing your own fruit and bottling and producing your own wine, you're still distributed. Where in the United States can they find you? Yeah, well, now we have, I have a distribution in Virginia. Uh, it's a company out there. Uh, I know they are uh, processing to another state of the uh, USA. Uh, here in New York, I don't have it. I'm here in this fair, in this event, to try to, to get someone who is interested uh, to have a very good opportunity to work here. Uh, that's why. What, uh, what is your, are you on social media anywhere? People can find out more about you, your website, where can people find out about you? Yeah, we have uh, the Regenzo Belgaco point uh, top, uh, where uh, you can find all the information and uh, you can contact uh, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Dracina Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions of what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media or at dracinawines at gmail.com. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or whichever podcasting program you use. To easily subscribe at iTunes, please go to bit.ly forward slash Dracina Podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash capital D for Dracina and capital P for podcast. We would greatly appreciate you leaving a review on your favorite system. It helps others to find us. Let's get social. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Pinterest, YouTube, Google Plus, and Periscope at, at Dracina Wine. And I am on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud. Check out our award-winning wine at dracinawines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Plancha. Thanks for listening to Dracina Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions of what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media or at dracinawines at gmail.com. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or whichever podcasting program you use. To easily subscribe at iTunes, please go to bit.ly forward slash Dracina Podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash capital D for Dracina and capital P for podcast. We would greatly appreciate you leaving a review on your favorite system. It helps others to find us. Let's get social. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Pinterest, YouTube, Google Plus, and Periscope at, at Dracina Wine. And I am on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud. Check out our award-winning wine at dracinawines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Plancha.